Hello, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Orthodox Christian Study Center, the uh, Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity series. We're in our 13th episode. We're excited to be back. We took a little bit of a break over the break. Um, before we, I introduce our guest speaker, who has led really such a very rich and very interesting life, looking very much forward to hearing about all her experiences. Uh, let me, of course, just simply tell you about our Orthodox Christian Studies Center. I'm going to try, my, for the first time on this webinar here, I think I'm going to tr try a, a screen share to see if I can find, if I can't find the, well, I'm not going to try a screen share because I can't find the um, thing I want to share with you, actually. So, um, oh, let me see here. So this is one of those Zoom glitches. Here we go. So I'm going to share with you uh, here, everyone, um, see our Orthodox Christian Studies website. Uh, we invite you to visit our website and you can see, uh, you know, the various uh, center uh, events that we do here on the left. We invite you also to go to Public Orthodoxy, our latest uh, article here, the Navalny Protest and Orthodoxy's Apolitical Theology and our our, our uh, essays are now being translated into many, many different languages um, over time. This one's in English, but eventually it will be published in Russian and Georgian tomorrow, right? And uh, Bulgarian and Romanian and Serbian. And uh, we're very proud of that. And of course, we invite you to go to our YouTube uh, channel here, where you'll see that we have actually past episodes of Women Scholars, Dr. Phoebe Armanos, Effie Foucault and others as well, as well as other programming. And if you like some of the stuff we do, uh, we invite you to subscribe uh, and to subscribe and maybe even like some of our stuff because the liking actually helps to, um, you know, sort of to, uh, affect the algorithm of things. So we invite you to, to join us and to kind of participate in our various, various flat platforms. So that's enough of my screen sharing. And now it's time for the main event. Tamara, my friends, uh, we've known each other for a very long time. Uh, so let me introduce to, to all of you, Tamara Grudzelidze. Did I do that okay? I did okay. <laughs> once, you do it right, one, once you do it once the right way, you're not sure if you're going to do it the second time the right way, but I did it even multiple times the right way. So it's much, it's much harder with the consonants, you know, Papa Nicolau. Is, oh, you know, you just kind of follow the, you know, they follow the vowels, but uh, when the consonants are together, it's a little bit tougher. Let me, let me, let me read your, your very rich uh, and, uh, you know, really full of rich experiences biography, and then we'll kind of get right to it, okay? So, um, you were born into a family of the Soviet intelligentsia, um, the Soviet equivalent of the middle class. And you were practicing Christians and regularly attended church. Uh, but then Tamar entered university with a plan to study classics and soon took an interest in old Georgian literature. At 25, you defended a thesis on symbolism in Georgian hagiography, And then you held a research position at the Institute of Georgian Literature while teaching Georgian language and literature at school. One day you're gonna have to teach me Georgian, maybe over Zoom. Um, but after the fall of the Iron Curtain and the rise of the Georgian National Movement. She decided to leave Georgia to assist with a course on Georgian culture at Mount Holyoke College, which then you, you were just there actually. And we can, we'll talk about that. And we'll talk about that in terms of your teaching. Right? You were back there again, teaching for a whole year. But then you met Metropolitan College of Swear at St. Vladimir's Seminary. And you decided to pursue a, a doctorate at Oxford. And Kalistos, Metropolitan Kalistos, famous Metropolitan Kalistos, uh, supervised your thesis on St. Maximus the Confessor. That must have really been a great experience and a great, and a, and a great honor, right? And then you had a brief return to Georgia, and then you applied for a job at the World Council of Churches, and you worked there as an Orthodox theologian. You were the first ex-Soviet staff member there, as well as the first Georgian and the first Orthodox woman and the Secretariat of the Faith and Order Commission, and one of the more important, really. I mean, they're all important, but let's 
be honest, the, the Faith and Order was really one of the most important commissions of WCC. Yeah, well, Jones and then, is worked there. Isn't he? And you, you worked 13 years in Geneva. And you and I, a few years ago, were together in Geneva, and you showed me around there. Um, it was really a wonderful experience, because we were there during the Great Festival in December, right? Yes. What do they, what do they call the festival in December? Uh, this is the... Um... Oh gosh, yeah. Um, yeah well, while you think of it, I'll, I'll think of that. I'll, I'll, I'll read that. But you were appointed after you work in Geneva. You were appointed the ambassador of Georgia, ambassador of Georgia to the Holy See, where we were together. You invited me very graciously for a conference, um, for a conference on autocephaly, marking the my, the anniversary of the autocephaly of the Georgian restoration. Yeah, one hundred restoration. Right, the restoration of the. We can talk about that as well. So now you're back home, you're back in Georgia, and you work at Elia State University teaching courses on Christian unity, religion, and politics, and Christian civilization. And you've written on various issues in Orthodox theology and history of the Orthodox Church of Georgia, and your books include One Holy Catholic and Apostolic Ecumenical Reflections on the Church, and you're a co-editor of Witness Through Troubled Times, A History of the Orthodox Church of Georgia, 1811 to the Present, many articles and writings, um, but uh, you also have a manuscript under review, which is really on autocephaly, right? Uh, the issue of autocephaly. And there really isn't, it's a very unique contribution because there really are many books on autocephaly. And tentatively, your manuscript, which is under consideration for one of the presses, an academic press, uh, Masters of Border Making, Ignoring Boundaries, right? So there's like way too much to talk about here. And I'm not really sure. <laughs> I'm not sure where to start because your life has been so incredibly rich as an Orthodox theologian um, and really someone who has pushed the boundaries and I, really someone who says, you know, when the Orthodox Church says no to women, normally, in terms of academic, uh, especially theological and academic, you wouldn't accept that as a no. And so tell us a, a little bit, I mean, we, we know that you grew up in a family that went to church, but tell us a little bit about um, how what what sort of inspired you to just uh, become a, a scholar of Orthodox Christianity? You know, what uh, I know it had some probably to do with your family, like with me, my father was a priest and that, that had something to do with it. But tell me a little bit about what, what was that moment when you knew that you wanted to do that, even knowing that the Orthodox Church in general, unfortunately, is not welcoming to uh, women scholars of Orthodox Christianity. Okay. Thank you. Um, if you allow me, I will say a few words of uh, gratitude for being here, for being invited. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, it is really very, uh, uh, very big honor for me to be invited by the uh, Center, uh, Orthodox, uh, Center of the Orthodox Christian Studies, because I think this is uh, one of very few places in the world where theology is done uh, in a way that I like it. So I'm really <laughs> very uh, honored to be. Uh, well, it's not the first time of our collaboration. I was mm -hmm. invited uh, two years ago. So I was uh, when mm -hmm. I was in New York. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, at Fordham. Uh, um, but really, it's a, a very uh, a good center and it does so many different things. And one of the things have become now, uh, if not popular, at least known for the time being in Georgia, which is uh, one of your forums that you uh, maintain, public orthodoxy. You showed in the beginning the mm -hmm. uh, newest uh, essay, which I read this morning. Uh, it was very, very interesting indeed. Uh, so this, uh, the articles, no, rather essays uh, or from public orthodoxy now been published, translated and published into Georgian uh, since the last year. So yeah, congratulations to those Thank who do. I don't know who does translation, but they're very good. And, you, you know, it's, it's very good uh, for us also because there is so little um, of uh, um, quality writing on orthodoxy, especially, uh, you know, for uh, wider public, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's uh, you can find more uh, writing, uh, good writing on orthodoxy in the scholarly world, but not so much uh, in public uh, sort of uh, 
sphere. So it's very good. Thank yeah. You. And then um, also I would like to mention this uh, fact that uh, I was uh, invited among this uh, very interesting other women theologians that you invited before me, 12 of them. Most of them were Americans, uh, two Brits and one Austrian. So, you know, I am from a very different world and you invited me, thank you. Some of them yeah, rather younger, uh, some of them eminent. So I, yeah, thank you for inviting me. Yeah. However, I'm not very keen on dividing theology between men and women, as I mentioned this time before. <laughs> so, I think that uh, professionalism is unisex, actually, and you, you don't uh, make this, you know, demarcation line, too, because very often uh, I've been in places where I'm only a woman, a theologian in the room, or uh, one of two or one of three women, and so I understand that there is this moment, you know, they, you know, the best uh, what is happening, especially if you are with uh, hierarchs in the room, they are kind to you, but they, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not sort of uh, exactly equality, but, you know, it's sort of, you know, a little bit uh, patronizing sort of attitude. And certainly, <laughs> yes, I know. It's really, not, it's really not funny, but yeah, but yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's, so you have to look yeah, at it. I guess we have to laugh. Otherwise, yeah. yes, we have to be a little... Uh, open-minded about it. Uh, so, and I understand that the center also tries to compensate this, um, what was lost for women uh, over the ages that they were deprived of their, you know, as they say, you know, a space of their own, a room of their own. And to their think voice, really. Their uh, their voice, voice, yes. yeah. and so it's great, yes. So Thank you. Very Thank good. You. So, so now to go to your question, your question was, uh, how did I um, end up with a theology, right? Yeah, how, so, how did, what was that moment? Sort of, we yeah. call it, you know, that aha moment, like, oh yeah, that's what yeah. I want. Yeah. Yes, yes, no, because uh, I, I didn't want uh, this in the beginning. I was very young when I got to university, so I was 16 and uh, uh, I really didn't know what I wanted. I wanted to uh, learn uh, uh, English, see, and then, uh, uh, a friend of my father who was professor there suggested that you know, she, she will learn English anyway, so let her study something else like classics, it's good. So I went, okay, I said, all right. But then uh, when I first went to university in the very first uh, class, we were uh, uh, introduced to uh, in, uh, the text, the gospels as part of the uh, old uh, ancient Georgian writings. I mean- uh, And this know, is still under the Soviet period. Yeah, yeah, very much under the Soviet period, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, um, I, and it was not new to me, uh, as you mentioned, you know, we were Christians uh, and we, uh, it was, new, not, was not new to me, but to uh, uh, study it at university, it was something like after the Soviet school, it was really something very different. Right. And uh, that was uh, important. And then hagiography, I liked very much. And certainly it ha these are always people who direct you in life. Isn't it true? I mean, you know, I had the um, professor whom I admired very much. I liked uh, how he taught this old Georgian literature. So, you know, I, I all of a sudden I said, no, I will not uh, go to classics. I will do old Georgian literature. And that's how I ended up with uh, doing hagiography. There was no theology at the time. We didn't have such thing as theology. And then uh, I, when I went to Mount Holyoke, uh, you know, this was also like, a, you know, absolutely unexpected. Uh, Stephen Jones, who is my a uh, good friend now uh, was looking, uh, I didn't know him at the time, he was looking for someone to uh, assist him in uh, teaching a course on Georgian culture. And I was suggested, uh, my name was suggested to him because, uh, you know, uh, people thought that I knew English. And I also thought that I knew English, but then when I got to Mount Holyoke and I had to face the students, American students, well, I was really, very scary moment because, yeah. yeah, you know, it was really, but uh, it went well. And then it, uh, after Mount Holyoke, yeah, how I ended up really with theology was that after Mount Holyoke, I went 
to Saint Vladimir's. Uh, I mean, why did you go to Saint Vladimir's? You, you just knew about his reputation. Yes, you, I knew about yeah. it. I knew the Germandorf was there. Yeah. Uh, the Germandorf was there. It was his last year, actually. He died that but, summer. But let me, before you go on, let me ask you. I mean, just even as someone uh, coming from Georgia and as a woman, as a scholar, as a, how did you even know about John Meyendorf? I mean, how did that? Well, um... Yeah, this was, uh, uh, you know, it was already. Uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, period, transition period. Uh, uh, and we started uh, reading books, which we uh, didn't have before. And Schmemann and Meindorf were the first uh, uh, books. I mean, uh, we had old books, you know, from ah, library, like okay. Florensky, Bulgakov, for instance. Oh, Bulgakov, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. yeah, I was 19 when I read Bulgakov and it, it had wow. huge uh, influence <laughs> on me, yes. Yeah. Uh, but you know, uh, I re I had read some uh, books here and there, but I didn't have systematic training. So when I got to Saint Vladimir's and I went to lectures um, there, I understood that uh, in order to teach theology, yes, because I wanted to ch teach theology, and I thought that you know my knowledge, uh, perhaps in hagiography and because uh, uh, I read also Church Fathers, would be enough to do this. But then. Mm -hmm. uh, after visiting St. Vladimir's, it became clear that it was not enough. So I had to do some systematic uh, studies in theology. And I already had my uh, PhD at that time. And then right. I uh, enrolled again as a student. So I, I became a student. And my students from uh, uh, gymnasium where I taught Georgian language and literature were teasing me afterwards. What did you teach us if you, if you went to study after <clears throat> teaching us. So you, what did you know when you were teaching us? They were teasing me. So I started to study. Yeah. And then at St. Vladimir Seminary, when I uh, uh, started my year, new year uh, at St. Vladimir's, Bishop Callistos, uh, came and gave us a commencement uh, speech. And that was really the moment when I thought that, okay, that's it, you know, I should uh, go. Yeah, he's mesmerizing, he really is. Yeah, really yeah. Is. When you first hear of his English and the way he uh, speaks and, uh, you know, what he says, I mean, it was really heavens open or something happened. So. He's, given, he's given two lectures at Fordham, our second Orthodox in America lecture, and then he gave another lecture on the council afterwards. When? Uh, in two, the, the Orthodox, first Orthodox in America lecture was 2005. And uh -huh. then around 2016, he came back to Fordham and gave another lecture. Okay, all oh, right, yeah. yes, yes. Okay, no. yes. Yeah. No, I was uh, in the 90s that I met him and um, I asked him to, uh, I asked him, can I study okay. with you? And he said that he would help me. And so he helped me to go there That's for great. one yeah. year. Yeah. And there are many people who studied under him, John Baer, Peter Batten, yes. so many people who have worked with they him. They were before him. me, uh, John Baer. Yeah, I mean, he, I mean, Father, Metropolitan Costos, Father Andrew Louth, I mean, those are the two giants of Orthodox Christianity. I mean, yeah. the uh, yeah. people that uh, have done so much to make Orthodoxy well known. And, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, when did, and so in terms of the WCC position now, I mean, again, I mean, your life has been one of constantly taking initiative in, a, in an Orthodox world that doesn't make that kind of initiative so easy. Yeah. And uh, well, you just you, did, you, did you just see the advertisement? And how did that happen with in terms of your no, You know it? what helps you to make yeah. these bold decisions when yeah. you are an Orthodox woman and you want to be a professional, yeah. you, you try to do something. So you go, yeah. I mean, well. <laughs> that would not be my choice uh, right. uh, uh, to go to WCC. Because, you know, as Orthodox and from Georgia, I wanted to study only patristics, liturgy, you know, this kind right. of thing. But then this opportunity um, arrived, sort of, you know, yeah. I, I saw that there was this possibility, Peter Butzenia was going back to the States, so I, I mm -hmm. uh, could apply for his position. Right. And uh, it was really the, uh, the first time that the woman worked in the secretariat. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think because Bishop Callistos gave me good uh, uh, references or, or that I was uh, from Georgia. I mean, there were several factors that uh, 
influence the decision to uh, employ me because it's a very important position for the yeah. Orthodox. You know, mm -hmm. you represent the Orthodoxy. You know, you right. don't represent one church there. Yeah. Right. And especially at a time, though, when the Orthodox, I mean, when I was in seminary in the early 90s, I mean, ecumenism was just a given that we were ecumenical. We had wonderful uh, ecumenists come, like uh, the great uh, Jean-Marie Tillard, mm. who was spectacular. I mean, the students would um, fill the auditorium just to listen to him talk about his experiences. I mean, it, and then all of a sudden, you know, within the Orthodox world, uh, the, this anti-ecumenism kind of started to grow. And... Um, and so can you tell us a little bit about that? And did, I mean, did that, did that start to change while you were at the WCC? And uh, how, how were you able to uh, deal with that? Anti-ecumenism, first I'll say something about anti-ecumenism. It's always there, you know, it's lying there. And yeah. the, it's not only for the Orthodox, but for others too. Whoever wants to use it for something, they can always go and use mm -hmm. anti-ecumenism. It works. Mm -hmm. uh, Orthodox... Um, I think uh, Orthodox uh, were, uh, you know, becoming this uh, very openly anti-ecumenical, anti mm -hmm. especially the two Orthodox churches withdrew from the membership, as you know, in 97. Uh, right. Bulgarian remind us, Church, remind us, it is, it is the Church of Georgia. And Georgia, Church yeah, of, one, Church of Georgia. And, and Bulgaria, and Bulgaria. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in uh, Georgia, it was clear. It was this uh, um, very clear politics uh, uh, from abroad, uh, brought to Georgia to it's a kind of uh, you know to help uh, isolation process. You know, mm -hmm. because uh, a, a late eighties, it was clear that this national movement uh, was um, becoming stronger and stronger, and then. You know, in uh, 91, uh, the uh, big uh, changes uh, were happening in the country. Uh, uh, and this, um, well, uh, secession from the Soviet uh, Union and independent declaration of independence. Mm -hmm. And the, clearly the church uh, uh, was one of the uh, one of the uh, weapons in all these movements and uh, to keep church uh, uh, in isolation I think this was the really behind this uh, anti-ecumenical uh, strong anti-ecumenical movement which was brought from uh, outside into Georgia yeah. because our patriarch uh, who is still our patriarch at yeah. the time, he uh, used to be uh, engaged in ecumenical uh, you know, meetings and he was one of the presidents uh, of the um, World Council of Churches for some time. So, and when uh, he was in, uh, actually enthroned in 1977, one of the projects, I know it from people who uh, whom he consulted. One of his projects was to open a, a joint school together, a theological school together with Catholics, because from his experience, he knew that Catholics were good at education, they had good schools, so he wanted to use this opportunity. But then um, things changed very much, you know, right. you know, then very quickly things changed very much. Right, right. And, and tell us more, I mean, how was your, I mean, uh, did you uh, enjoy your experience at the WCC? I mean, did you, I mean, can you maybe yes. identify, maybe identify for us, maybe, uh, I mean, I'm sure the entire experience was significant, but maybe one or two really significant moments during your time there that uh, maybe that, uh, that remain with you. Yes, I think uh, one of the major uh, uh, sort of, uh, moments of my work there was that I didn't expect to like it so much because oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, it was I think it was, of, <laughs> I, I think it was the, I think it was the hot wine in uh, in Geneva I think maybe that's what did well, it well yeah, no, yeah. no no not only <laughs> <laughs> no and but the cheese and the, cheese and, the and the and the cheese the um what's it called the um What's the hot cheese that you dip into again? I forget what the name of it is. Oh, this I don't like. Fondue, I don't like. Fondue, no. that's it, yeah. But anyway. But, uh, no, but I, yeah. But you liked it very much. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yes, because uh, I, you know, as I said, I wanted to do patristics and, uh, you know, to this, our orthodox things. And then uh, I discovered that uh, it, you know, it gives you a very wide horizon. If you want to see this horizon when you are with so many uh, Christians, different Christians, and you work with them on theology, theological issues, you know, it gives you incredible experience and knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, which you um, uh, will not be able to uh, get only from books because, you know, in meetings you have incredible exchange. Yeah. And one of the best things, for instance, for me is, for instance, I was advocating very much one project uh, on the sources of authority. Then it was published in two volumes. Uh, the first part was about the early church uh, sources of authority, you know, as early church. Mm -hmm. And then uh, contemporary churches, what do they do with authority? And uh, uh, it was not easy to promote this project because, you know, this was my orthodox really uh, sort of uh, endeavor to do something for, from um, the orthodox point of view, you know, patristics, early patristics. Uh, but then uh, it was very nice to see how people who were not so much keen on this project in the beginning became passionate about it yeah. and they yeah. really liked it. And so it was yeah. uh, something uh, memorable, I mean, and uh, amazing experience really. Yeah, I mean, I we find that in, in I mean, it's in a, in an age of polarization. Um, it's easy to demonize the one you haven't met, but then when you meet someone, you you sort of say to yourself, "Oh, well, <laughs> didn't expect to like this person." I mean, because you know, we live in, in bubbles that create these impressions about people, about people, peoples, and uh, but you know, when you come face to face, so in many ways. Uh, the value of the uh, uh, these face-to-face -face encounters, these ecumenical oh, movements, is really the the face-to-face -face encounters uh, yeah. of people. I mean, you know that in many ways it's uh, you're always going to disagree, but then uh, to feel that the sense of friendship emerging uh, is something uh, uh, you know it's it's something in many ways difficult to express. I think, and I'm sure you have so many friends from. From that time. Yes, sure. I think the most difficult thing is, you know, what happens, it's very difficult to take with you and to deliver this message to right, right. your place, what you experience there and what right. you understand right. there. So yeah. how it, it's, this is um, still a problem. It's very much like, um, I always think about this, you know, the psalm passage, taste and see that the Lord is good. I mean, it's, that's, the, that experience in many ways is, uh, 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 can you extend it in so many ways in different kinds of things like just taste and see you know yeah. and uh, and um, you know that doesn't mean smoothing over the differences that's the great uh, oh. misunderstanding uh, I think uh, when it comes to communism it's really the personal context so uh, we have to get to your time now uh, um, you know at the Vatican of course which yeah. you know I was uh, you kindly invited me uh, to an event there when you were celebrating restoration of the autocephaly and we had uh, uh, just wonderful experiences sort of I had to leave before uh, you arranged an audience with the Pope so I didn't get a chance to although I did see him, I did see him deliver his, his Sunday sermon uh, which was really something so I, I'm really grateful to you for uh, all these experiences that you've opened up to me of course and before we get to the uh, I always forget to do this but to everyone participating of course there is a Q&A function uh, if you want to ask and maybe expand and uh, any one of these aspects of Tamara's life, you know, her time at Oxford, WCC, at the Vatican in Georgia, and of course her scholarship really, which now is centering on issues of autocephaly and ecclesiology, which she has a great deal of experience in and uh, knowledge of. But, but anyway, let's go back now to your, to the, to your time as the, uh, as the Georgian ambassador. I mean, what was... I mean, yes. so let me, if I may, Tamara, and I, I, I say this only to maybe uh, provoke with you a, an answer that will disabuse people of this impression. I mean, some people might think to be an ambassador to the Vatican, uh, maybe obviously is not as important as being an ambassador to Paris or to France. But uh, no, but tell us, tell us that how wrong that is in many ways in terms of the various relations of various countries, especially an Orthodox country uh, to the Vatican. So. 
Uh, yes, indeed, these were amazing years in my life because uh, 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 I think uh, without this uh, um, uh, experience at the WCC, I wouldn't be uh, able or I wouldn't be, you know, right. even uh, a suitable person because uh, because of my uh, 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 this international sort of experience, it it was. Uh, suggested that uh, I would be sent to, uh, they would send me to you know, the Holy See. And uh, yeah, in the beginning, I uh, didn't understand what was this about, again, <laughs> as always in the beginning. And then I asked uh, some friends, uh, people I knew from my work in Geneva, um, what it would be to be ambassador and I was encouraged. So, uh, and I found it really very, very interesting for me personally, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, as you said, um, uh, highest uh, sort of uh, uh, honor is to send people to, uh, as ambassadors to, you know, to the United States or to mm -hmm. France, or to, but, but if, uh, even if I'm offered, I wouldn't go there because, uh, I'm, I was interested uh, in the Holy See because of my background. So mm -hmm. I knew people already, you know, because of uh, our WC, Faith and Orders collaboration, close collaboration with the uh, Pontifical Council for Promotion of Christian Unity. And uh, we, uh, because of uh, my long standing uh, uh, friendship and collaboration with Bose community, you know. So right. I really well, knew just for our viewers, the Bose community is a monastic community west of um, of Milan that's been there for at least sixty years and is dedicated to ecumenical. In fact, they have Catholic and Protestant monastics uh, that are living together officially, and then uh, there are even Orthodox, not officially uh, as monastics of the community but uh, who live there, uh, who, have, who have lived there. And in fact, uh, the great uh, ecumenist metropolitan Emilianos Timiadis uh, actually uh, ended his life there. I mean, he, he remained there until the end of his life. And uh, they have a, a conference every year in September on Orthodox spirituality. But, uh, but so you, you were saying your connections there as well helped you? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and then um, the, when I uh, found myself in, uh, Vatican, uh, yes, uh, you know, I understood that uh, this is a place where uh, ambassadors do whatever they decide to do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I, decide, I decided to do what I knew. So mm -hmm. I organized in my four and a half years, uh, during my four and a half years uh, as ambassador, I organized five conferences uh, and, uh, and, other things also, I mean, meetings and, uh, uh, but, you know, this was uh, a highlight for me. Also, I uh, published one book. I uh, edited one book in Italian about the relations of, uh, between the Georgians uh, and uh, Rome. So mm -hmm. you know, all starting from the um, antiquity to our times. Um, so this, these were very interesting years. And certainly the pontificate uh, of Francis is uh, interesting. And for right. me, it was very special to be there at, at that, that time. time. Yeah. And yeah. he, visit, he visited Georgia. Yes, so it was also... Yeah. Uh, and you, yeah. you, must, you must have been a part of those plans and everything. I mean, it must have well, been... Sure, been, yes. But, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, certainly I'm very proud that the uh, Pope mm -hmm. visited Georgia when I was ambassador. Mm -hmm. But it is not only uh, ambassador at the, decided at the ambassador's right. level. The Vatican right. decides itself what to do, where to go. Right. So it was Pope's uh, policy to go to uh, peripheries, as he speaks mm -hmm. now about this, and uh, to go to smaller um, countries, to go to countries where they have uh, more problems. So mm -hmm. yes, he wanted to go to the Caucasus, and he wouldn't go to only one country. And so right. he went to three, uh, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan and Georgia. Yeah, right. but I but still I was ambassador, so it was very right. nice. 
Right. Well, I remember uh, when I was there, you gave us a wonderful private tour of the library, uh, which is uh, of the of, of sort of the museum, I should say. Yeah. And uh, but I also remember, <laughs> you know, I visited. I was fortunate enough to visit with my family quite a few years ago, and you were ambassador at the time. And I was telling you about it, and you said, "Why didn't you? Why didn't you tell me? I could have arranged a private." Uh, <laughs> so I missed out on that opportunity. I, I guess I, I don't know if you still have any pull to give to arrange for private uh, tours of the museum. But next time I go, I'll I'll, I'll, ch I'll uh, check in. I'll check in with you to see. It, it could. Uh, I, I'm. I can't promise, but I will try. <laughs> okay, you'll try. So we have a few questions. So before we get to the questions. And again, I invite people to uh, uh, ask questions in the Q and A function, right? But back, you know, now you're back. In yeah. Georgia. You're teaching. You're a professor. You yeah. have time to work on a little bit more directly on your writing and your scholarship. And now you're 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 preparing a manuscript uh, on uh, Orthodox ecclesiology, but specifically autocephaly, which really it's surprising. There really isn't a uh, in the English-speaking world, anyway, uh, there really isn't a book on it uh, on autocephaly per se, um, and so it 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 feels like um, you you're exactly where you want to be. Is that is that right? I mean, you really want yes. to be a teacher yes, exactly. and a scholar, yes. and then you want to really just yeah do that, right? I mean, so I wanted very much to come home and to teach, <laughs> but I didn't want to be enclosed. You know, I didn't right. imagine. So, yeah, yeah, I know it's difficult. difficult. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's difficult, but still, yes, I want it uh, always, uh, eventually, to teach here in Georgia. You know, yeah. to you know, to share what I learned or experienced mm -hmm. uh, somehow with my students. I mean, when it's possible. I mean, it's it's right. more difficult with undergraduates. Yeah, I have one undergraduate mm -hmm. course, and it's not so easy, but. Uh, with graduate students, I've been uh, very fortunate so far, so we'll see. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's really great. Yes, I like it very much. And I try to, uh, you know, there is no uh, theology per se. There's, uh, no theology, there's no theology faculty? No, no. there is religious department. Okay. So, but uh, I had the... Uh, a, you know, um, discussion with people in the department that perhaps we'll start slowly mm -hmm. introducing with anthropology, Christian anthropology, not uh, orthodox, but mm -hmm. wider, which in I, uh, years ago, I found it um, difficult to teach just theology because I've come across uh, mm -hmm. faculties and uh, professors who teach theology. Right. And I thought, oh my God, if you don't know one theology, how can you teach just theology, you know? Right. But yeah. I think uh, um, uh, I'm more positive about it now and I will yeah. try, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just, I, it is a little bit different, but in many ways, your position there is, is somewhat groundbreaking because uh, in other Orthodox countries, it's hard to find uh, women who uh, are on uh, Orthodox on faculties. Um, uh, I mean, most of the faculties within Orthodox countries are theology faculties, uh, so that's a little bit different. But uh, you do in Greece, you do find people there are wonderful. There's uh, Katerina uh, Salambuni and some others who are wonderful scholars there. And uh, but in general, in, in most Orthodox countries, you really don't. Uh, other than teaching languages, you don't really have women scholars. Uh, you definitely don't have women theologians like yourself. So to some extent, your presence there is is in many ways groundbreaking for the for the Orthodox world. So um, can you tell us? Um, can you tell us a little bit about? Um, well, I mean, is there, um, do you find that there's a, an interest in theology in, in your teaching amongst the students? Do you think that they're interested in it? Uh, do you think that they enjoy uh, talking uh, to you about these issues here they're, they're in Georgia? Oh, yes, definitely. Yes. My yeah. students, uh, uh, I mean, graduate students, you yeah. know, um, they were very much interested. Uh, with, in the course with the religion and politics, they were not supposed to know, you know, they even told me that uh, they were hesitating in the beginning whether to take this course or not because of lack of knowledge in religion or mm -hmm. Christianity. And, but uh, somehow I think we managed, yes. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, you understand for us, it's a very important subject. I mean, right. <laughs> it should be 
uh, taught properly taught i think uh, in mm -hmm. many places but uh, yeah. it is not easy yeah yeah so um i want to get to the a little bit about your your uh the manuscript but um we have some uh, questions in the q a and i just want maybe get to some of those just to make sure that we uh, you have of course regards from a wonderful friend nadia trimmer uh ah. kaka bear Kutanidze uh, sends you a message in Georgian, which I can't uh, uh, translate. So you want to look in the, I think you have access to the Q&A. You can just take a look at that. But uh, I do have, there is an interesting question here uh, from Paul Krigel. Do you still do some work on hagiography, right? I'm asking as someone who works on St. Nino, including a co-author translation and commentary on the Shatberdi variant of Mokave Okay. Yeah, so I didn't do bad. I didn't do bad there. So, yeah. So do you still work on hagiography or? Um, uh, not really. Last time uh, I worked on hagiography was when I published uh, uh, in English translation uh, of two uh, lives of the Georgian Athenite monks. Mm -hmm. I don't know if Paul has this. Is familiar with this? translation yes and uh, this was uh, a serious work because you know th this are the 11th century lives uh, written in the beginning and the end of the 11th century and then um, yeah so I translated it into English with some commentaries mm -hmm. uh, not at the moment no no I'm not working on hagiography no okay. unfortunately yeah um there's another question here in terms of um, by Dorothy Carey, just, uh, you know, what was your family's influence, your family's influence on your extraordinary career? I mean, we know you grew up in the family, but was there even more explicit uh, yeah. encouragement, promotion, anything like that? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, in, the, in my family, there was no distinction between me and my brother in terms of education or mm -hmm. giving some, you know, mm -hmm. attention. Uh, so... This was, uh, yeah, what I received from my family. They helped very much with education. They were very supportive uh, uh, for everything I did, you know, because um, uh, there was no difference, you know, because I was a woman, you know. But the influence of the family, yes, because uh, uh, in the Soviet Union, we didn't travel, so we depended mm -hmm. very much on immediate uh, circle of uh, people, immediate uh, societies around us. And my parents were uh, had very good friends. And so I learned a lot also from this close circle from childhood. Uh, I learned from them a lot about culture, about, you know, uh, how to resist the Soviet regime and, you know, right. these kind of things. Well, I mean, there is a, a question on autocephaly, and that relates to your um, uh, that relates to your current work. But before we get to that, and maybe we didn't delve enough into just hearing a little bit about, um, yeah, I mean, what was it like to be a practicing Christian in Soviet Georgia? I know under the various communist regimes, it was a little bit different. So it's a little bit different under Tito Serbia than under, um, you know, the the you know, the Russian Soviet system, et cetera, et cetera. So what was it like growing up as a Christian? I mean, yeah, was there, you tell us a little about that. Were there um, other intellectual um, uh, Christians that you were in touch with as a, as a young person there and that uh, having conversation, what kind of conversations did you have and, and how did you avoid uh, it affecting you in terms of uh, repercussions uh, from the uh, Soviet system, et cetera? I mean, can you, Maybe tell us a little bit about that. I mean, what was it like growing up as Christian? You know, it's, it yeah. was very different from uh, Russia, as far as yeah. I understand, because I yeah. know from my uh, friends uh, back then that it was much stricter. I mean, mm, yeah. more people were uh, sort of afraid of uh, declaring their Christianity. You know, we were periphery for uh, Russia, for Moscow. So right. it was... Uh, uh, I mean, not encouraged, and the church certainly was infiltrated, but right. uh, uh, it was not uh, so restricted. Although, it, perhaps it was not restricted because not so many people went to the church 
or I don't know which one was. Most people would uh, say they were Orthodox and perhaps mm -hmm. most of them were baptized, mm -hmm. but the, uh, there was no uh, habit of going uh, uh, to the church, you know, they didn't practice it. So I was really an exception in the class at school or even at university. It was very rare that uh, people, uh, or, you know, my friends would go to worship in the church. It was, right. they, although they were Christians. So this was kind of, um, kind of Christianity in Georgia, right. uh, which uh, was persecuted Certainly, uh, I mean, anything, any free thought was persecuted, but not as severely as uh, uh, in Moscow. Right, right. Yeah. That's very helpful. I, in my opinion. Or also, yeah. I, I, uh, it was worse perhaps before my childhood and, uh, you know, in the 70s, perhaps it was not so bad. And, right. You know, it changed a little bit. But what, how is it, I mean, there's a couple more questions, but how, many, how is it now, though? I mean, we hear that Georgia actually, um, amongst the Orthodox countries, the two countries that really get, and this is, is, is borne out even in these Pew studies now, because they're starting to actually, the Pew Research Center is actually starting to study the Orthodox countries. But the two countries that uh, um, are two of the most, uh, you know, yes. religious in terms of, identification, but actual participation are Romania and Georgia. Is that true or in your experience? I think that... Armenia, Armenia. Ro Rom uh, Romania in the Orthodox, maybe Armenia, I'm not sure. I didn't Armenia see was the first one I saw, I don't know. Was it? Okay. Uh, yeah, Armenia and Georgia, but I don't know. Yeah, or Romania. Georgia, uh, in terms of participation, I think now it's been reduced, uh, mm -hmm. but still, uh, I mean, uh, churches were much more packed few years ago than they are now. I think young people are trying to stay away from the church. I think intelligent young people try difficult to be part of the church today. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, so, you know, yeah. Yeah. it has the church uh, really uh, encounters uh, trials and tribulations at the moment so but it's, it a, has, but, it, but it's one of the most trusted institutions though right now in georgia is that true or is not true i know in romania it is but. if it is uh, so it does not mean that uh, uh, it's it uh, explains 100 percent to or it stands 100 percent to what it says okay yeah. you know yeah it is yeah. but it does not mean that uh, yeah yeah. So, okay. So we have, let's get to the questions. We have, we do have a comment from Father Andrew Laws. We're very honored that he's joined us. I didn't know he was on. So just a comment, and maybe if you want to have a return comment to go back to what you were saying about teaching, not so much theology as religion, given the constant news one has of Orthodox zealots, and indeed the hierarchy reigning in any real thoughtful theology, perhaps your way forward is the most promising. I mean, maybe he's right about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, thank you, Father Andrew. Yeah, I think that's uh, my point of view also that, uh, mm -hmm. for instance, what I try to explain to my students, uh, uh, what is wrong in, um, for instance, in, from my point of view, what is not uh, a right uh, way of seeing uh, the church today, uh, because that's the prevailing view uh in society and what is what, what there should not be and how the church actually must stand for itself and right. not be always depending on uh others other powers right to right. you know the problem with us uh, with the church at the moment is that it's trying to be a state within a state so yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting way to put it. Yeah, I think in in many Orthodox countries, I think that's the case. I think, uh, but the patterns are still different. Maybe the, yeah. uh, the, they are trying to. But for instance, in Russia, you cannot say that it's the uh, same thing is happening. In, uh, that's true. They, yeah, because in, um, in Georgia, it's a 
two-folded relationship with, of, of yeah. two powers, uh, yeah. uh, have, you know, heavenly powers, Caesar's power, and they are trying to feed each other, you know? Yeah. They, uh, it, it's not, they're careful with one another and they are trying to be beneficial to one yeah. another. In Russia, yeah. it's different. I mean, you know, it's... Yeah, I, I think it's interesting to see how the different, uh, there's, how the different church state relations are playing out in the various countries, uh, in the various, um, uh, you know, traditionally called Orthodox countries. Um, I think not, it's not quite the same in each one. Although I will say, and maybe you could correct me on this, I will say that in each of those countries, the Orthodox, institutional Orthodox churches are trying to maintain a certain priority or privilege, I think, uh, within that particular nation state. So. Well, nation states, yes, it's yeah. it's in, uh, somehow it is uh, uh, a must to have yeah. this. Uh, uh, but I, I connect, uh, you know, in my whatever I wrote this manuscript that you mentioned, I connect it with autocephaly. I mean, you know, it's it's a very um, careful examination of autocephaly is needed in order to understand how it. Uh, uh, actually damages the church today. Right. So, autocephaly is a pride of every uh, nation, nation state, national state. But, right. uh, and I believe that uh, Ukraine also, what they uh, are claiming for is quite all right for Ukraine at the moment within the given, uh, within the given circumstances. But, you know, we, it should be uh, reflected upon. What is yeah, it? I mean, um, that's the that's the current focus of your work, right? And actually, there is a question here. Um, can the Orthodox Church in the Ukraine hope to resolve their autocephalous status in the near future? And your, your, <laughs> your thesis is that the very concept of autocephaly is the problem. Is that, am I wrong? In, in yes, no, it is, uh, it's a problem because uh, it should be in the, uh, because it has never been uh, really uh, interpreted. It has never been, it just, it's carried uh, out, you know, we carry it from, or the church carries out it from uh, generation to generation, but uh, it uh, involves so many different aspects of church life or life in general, you know, uh, organized life, that uh, it, it should be uh, reflected. It should be a serious uh, subject of reflection. But yet, I mean, if I can just maybe push you a little bit on this, but yet um, George is very proud of yeah. this, of this uh, lesser known historical reality, which actually I'm embarrassed to say, I've been studying Orthodox Christianity since I was a teenager and I didn't really know this. But, ortho I mean, according to the Orthodox Church of Georgia, their autocephaly doesn't go back to the nation state years. It actually goes back to the earliest centuries. Yes. Right? Yeah. Yes. yes but right, So that's why you call it the restoration because so no, to some extent, right. I mean, in other words, just a quick comment on this. Uh, I'll say a sentence and then you can comment, but autocephaly, I mean, the Orthodox you know, they, they brag about it, they promote it, they, you know, but uh, we all know that, um, that uh, yes, it has something to do with the empire and, you know, sort of uh, uh, the, the way the empire was um, separated and just simply was practical. Um, but ecclesiologically, it gained steam with all the nation states, right? Because every, every nation, and we see that now, even with Montenegro and other countries, and I mean, we see that it's linked to the, the idea of the nation now, but we also, I mean, in the Georgian history, we see that it, it goes back to a period where it had nothing to do with the empire or the Byzantine empire. Oh. Uh, and uh, there was a sense, yeah, anyway, maybe you can talk to us a little bit about that because that's okay. your current project and yeah. You have a unique perspective in terms of Georgian history. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but still, without Byzantium, Georgia would never have received uh, or granted. Okay. Would have yeah, been right. granted. Okay. So, you know, it has to do with uh, empire. It was not part of the Commonwealth. Georgia was not part of the Byzantine Commonwealth, right. but, uh, right. but it benefited from uh, uh, 
the fact of being on the crossroad of, uh, uh, you know, geographically, and also that, you know, it had to fight, uh, it had to go either to uh, uh, take a position or uh, the benefits from Iran or from Byzantium. And then, you know, uh, actually I, I'm um, exposing this in my work as uh, far as I could do it uh, on the basis of some uh, uh, scholarly work that uh, uh, Georgia, I mean, Georgia didn't exist then, it was Iberia. Iberia uh, 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 took advantage of certain political situations and uh, was clever uh, in using these circumstances for the sake of political uh, gain, you know. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. they, uh, the king wanted to, uh, the, uh, to wanted to promote autocephaly, or it was not autocephaly in the uh, in the un same terms that we use today. But you know, right. whatever it was uh, um, in the fifth century, autocephaly was not in use yet. But yeah. still, this uh, privileges, yes, of independence or self governance of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, the, mm, uh, the but it was used for political purposes. Yeah, interesting. So well, I mean, that's, always there. Yeah, yeah. that's always there in autocephaly. That is it. Yeah. That, that, and that's the thing. You're right. It's not purely, it's never been a purely theological concept. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. So <laughs> Father Andrew, so we just have a few minutes and Father Andrew adds, on autocephaly, it is worse than that. I'll send you a paper I wrote a couple of years ago. So for a conference on autocephaly at Rome, at uh, yeah. PIO, so he'll he'll be sending you this paper. I was there too. Yeah, so. and yeah. So and then uh, one last question, and I think this is a really all oh, they've all been excellent questions, of course. Um, well, someone adds here too. There's a huge Syrian influence also in terms of the yes. other question. Well, so, um, but one last, yeah, one last uh, question here, which I think is a really interesting one. Going back to your WCC days now, right, by right. Nikol and this year. Where were there projects, dreams, expectations that you would have liked to see achieved during your service with Faith and Order Commission at the WCC, but couldn't? Right? Okay. Yes. Were you, any, any regrets, any disappointments, any, yeah, so... Yes, great disappointments were uh, the mm, uh, things that you would have liked that you're really hoping to see and just didn't happen. But yeah, yeah. the way the Orthodox participated uh, in the ecumenical movement was my disappointment. But any anything specific though that you were kind of like trying to push through and you just couldn't. Um, get I I would not mention now things, but I think yeah. you know a lot. <laughs> in, of in your in your memoir, I mean, you really, yeah. I mean, you really should write a memoir given all your experiences. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. you know there were some amazing people uh, orthodox with whom uh, I collaborated and they were excellent and they were dedicated but most of the orthodox you know were there I don't know why just to have a platform you know to to have to to be there and it was not only uh, their pre uh, non a substantial presence that uh, was annoying but the w way they prevented others from participation, see, mm -hmm. because it's always limited. I mean, it's a right. huge forum. You cannot send the hundreds of people, you send only a couple of people. And if they are not collaborative, and then if you are Orthodox right. and then in, uh, in a room with uh, 10 people, two Orthodox are not up to the standard, you don't right. feel good, <laughs> you know, you feel right. like- so, Yeah, so in many ways you were trying to, um... In many ways, your one of your one of your goals was really to get the Orthodox to to not always get in the way, and that maybe and that you didn't always you weren't always able to accomplish that, I guess, right? Yes, that was uh, um, yeah, yeah, that was a little bit. But dreams certainly uh, there were dreams. But as I said, one of these projects that uh, actually two projects with uh, uh, Patristic that uh, that. Uh, the commission promoted because uh, I was helped so much by uh, commissioners themselves. They were interested in this, but you know, uh, that, that was really good. That was. Yeah. yeah. Well, Tamara, there is one more question on uh, sort of the comparing the autocephalies of OCA and the Ukraine, but uh, maybe that's a question uh, that you can take up in your uh, manuscript. And uh, so give people, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's from an anonymous attendee, but um, 
Uh, we can just simply say that uh, you know your manuscript is in process. I think uh, it will probably, uh, what are we, 2021? By 2022 or so, late, uh, the way book publishing goes, I think we'll probably see something from you. And then uh, maybe um, this is a question that you can uh, take up in, uh, 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 in your manuscript, or at least address it a little bit in terms of, I guess, I think what you're trying to argue is how the concept of autocephaly creates these problems, right, uh, that we're seeing with the OCA in the Ukraine. And uh, so it'll be interesting to see, uh, uh, you know, how you, um, you know, how you theologically suggest for us to kind of maybe move past the, the issues and the questions of autocephaly. Um, so it was great to be with you. I mean, I could talk with you for hours and hours and hours, of course. Uh, and uh, and uh, yeah, so it's really wonderful. And it was a great uh, honor for us to have you. And uh, of course, you have been part of uh, events in the past and will be part of events in the future. And uh, um, I don't know what more to say, except it's great to see you and great to be in touch thank with you. Thank you so much. And thank you for making the time. Mm -hmm. George, and uh, uh, thanks to you and to others at uh, your center. Thank you. And I wish you all the best and uh, please continue working thank like you. you do because it's very important. Thank, thank you. you. And so uh, our next, uh, we will continue these uh, women, uh, these webinars. Our next one actually will be, um, uh, well, I'm not sure exactly when it's going to be, <laughs> either in March and April. All the more reason for you to yes. sign up for our email list and to, and to be informed of this as well. Um, but uh, other than that, this will also be available on uh, YouTube. Uh, and so please uh, spread the word on our, about our channel and the various programming is there. There's now with COVID, as you're cleaning your house, you can sort of listen to these wonderful conversations. So, so bye, Tamara. We'll be in touch. Bye, Kelly. Okay? Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Have a good bye. evening. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.